exclamation for Israel's 70th birthday. It was 70 years ago this Wednesday night, the 5th of ER on the Jewish calendar, in 1948, that David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence and established the Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael to be known as the State of Israel. And here we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of that historic moment in the 3,000 year life of the Jewish people. And this week on JBS, we join with Jews all over the globe in congratulating the people of Israel, the men and women and children who energize Israeli life and truly Jewish life all over the world. And this Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we hope you'll join our live celebration as we are right here, as I am joined in studio first by Thane Rosenbaum, who has been a dear friend and sits with me on all occasions like this. Thane, thank you so much for being here. And Shaharazani, the former media counsel at the Israeli consulate in New York, who now is Northeast director of one of the most important and effective organizations helping Jews on college campuses and really Jews throughout the world stand with us. Shachar, it is so wonderful to be with you as well. I thank both of you so very, very much. And Shachar, I want to begin with you. You are an Israeli. Where were you born? Ramat Gan. Ramat Israel. Gan. Yep. Okay. Um, as an Israeli, what's it mean to you, Shachar, to now see Israel celebrate its 70th anniversary? It's unbelievable on, on two levels. One, as an Israeli, I can only be jealous and envious at what's happening in Israel tonight and tomorrow. The flocks of people, the celebrations, the laughter, the joy, the family, that incredible transition from pain of Yom HaZikaron and the memory mm -hmm. of all those who fell on, in the wars and fighting for Israel to this joyous and momentous moment of the State of Israel. And then from here, Mark, from here, to be with my brothers and sisters here in, in the United States and to feel it together and to share that joy that we have in the miracle that's Israel. Take a moment, not only 70, but every Independence Day, and think to yourself, how is that possible? And it is. Mm -hmm. What is for you, Shachar, the special quality? And you know, I've talked already about the Jewish people, the Israeli people. When you try to explain to others what the unique character of the Israeli people and the Jewish state is, what do you point to? The unyielding optimism and problem solving. The fact that no amount of pain will bring us down. That in times of great hardships that we experience in our lifetime, when the terrorist attacks took place or when bad things happen, people carry about their business as usual to build, to create, to develop, never losing the opportunity for a smile, even though it might sometimes live in parallel with great pain. Mm -hmm. That is the resilience of a people, a nation, an idea, an ideology. Oh, that's lovely. All right, Thane. So here you are. You're an award-winning novelist. You are the director of the Forum on, on Law, Culture, and Society. You're a distinguished fellow at NYU Law School. But most of all, Thane, you are one of the leading liberal voices on the American scene, and you are without question one of the most passionate and articulate defenders of the state of Israel. In many ways, the two of you together represent everything I want JBS to be, together the two of you. But from your perspective, Thane, why is the 70th anniversary of the state of Israel so important? Well, Mark, again, it's so happy to be here with you again and on Israel's birthday and with Shahar. It's just lovely and this great set. It's great to be here. It's really very much a celebration. Humbling in many ways. Um, 70 is a real number. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm old enough. When I, when I, Israel was, uh, you know, when I was born, Israel was only 12 years old. It didn't have a bar mitzvah yet. And, and that's young. And my entire childhood growing up, through the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, people forget that even with you know Israel's existential issues with Iran, and still being threatened of being wiped off the map, there was a time where every year was a miracle. 
mm. in Israel. Every, every every other year, it was like, oh my God, Israel's another year older. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after the Holocaust, everything was possible when it came to the Jews. And so, you know, I remember uh, the Yom Kippur War, that sense of utter horror that, oh my God, this might be that time. I don't think anyone feels that way anymore about Israel. I don't think, you know, you could be an Iranian cleric and threaten Israel. I don't think anyone, including the Iranians, take that seriously. Mm -hmm. Israel's not going anywhere. Um, it, it's really, this is actually one of the reasons why I was in, very much in favor and happy for President uh, 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 Trump's acknowledgement, recognition of Jerusalem as uh, Israel's eternal capital for one major reason, because I think it's important for the Palestinians to everyone adjust to what everyone else already knows, which was Israel's here, it's not going anywhere. And I think 70 is a sign of maturity. Uh, you know, you can, you, they can pick up a social security <laughs> check now. And I think that that's where, you know, at 100 it's going to be yet even more. But I think that 50 was significant, 70 is clearly significant that it's a sign of its, its robustness, its vitality, its emergence into the world. You know, we now know these statistics, you know, what is it, the 11th most happy people on the planet mm -hmm. are Israelis, right? We know about the startup nation. We, you know, Israel has eventually reinvented water, right? There isn't anything that they haven't been involved in. And I think that there's just an incredible amount of pride for all of us in the diaspora. It's 70 years old. And the last thing I want to say about this is, you know, in America, July 4th is a place, a time for barbecues or a mattress sale. Uh, this is not true in Israel, you know? I mean, Shahar is right. He knows what it would be like tonight. He knows how, how boisterous. I was once in Israel on this eve, and it was really unlike anything I'd, I'd ever seen. I, because Americans don't do this. The fireworks is not quite this. Uh, but I think that this is to think about, this would be like the United States before the Civil War. You know, it's still a young country, but it's a country that's truly come of age. It's, it's emerged on, onto the true geopolitical scene and in the cultural scene, music scene, the science scene, and we're all here taking such enormous pride in it. Shahar, isn't that lovely for you to hear? An American Jew articulates so wonderfully the breadth of Israel. And you know, we say on JBS all the time, this is flesh and blood. Yes, the concept of Israel is very important. It's been a driving force in Jewish history from the moment of the exile. At the same time, it's not about a piece of earth. It's about human beings who have created something spectacular. And they did it toward the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century when the land was just, it was a big desert. And it, what Israel has done, the human beings, the people of Israel, is so extraordinary. So when I hear Thane describe it that way, it really touches my heart and I'm thinking to myself, you know, here you are, you're a native Israeli, you are your Sabra, and yet you've, you know, you've devoted a lot of your life to articulating for those who would listen, not only in the United States, as a diplomat, you've been in other countries as well. Correct. And now you're working with Stand With Us, and it's, you know, there is no one who's doing a better job than you, Shahar, okay. and Stand With Us is, a, is an organization. But what's it like for you as an Israeli to hear an American Jew express, and what Thane is expressing, many people would say to you, Shahar, what's it mean to well, you? Well, you know, first of all, with Thane, I'm never surprised and <laughs> eagerly consuming the articulation of those beautiful ideas because you can only, it's, it's a philharmonic song of, of beauty and essence of truth. I, I have to say, though, that I love the comment about the age and 70, because if you remember, you hosted here last year Elgin Long, 91 years old, the yes. Alaska Airlines pilot who brought the Yemeni Jews, part of, a, part of them in 1949 on eagle's wings to Israel. Yes, and let's be fair, although I hosted him, it was on your show, Eyes, <laughs> Eye on Israel, and you ha did a fabulous conversation with Thank him, and you, you also hosted him at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Right. But go ahead. So at the time, he said he hasn't been back in Israel since 1949. And I asked him, I said, Elgin, would as you the like... the Yemenite airlift. As, as the Yemenite airlift. And I said, Elgin, would you like to go back? He said, absolutely, that's my dream. I said, Elgin, do you have a time frame? Because we're doers, right? Israelis. <laughs> you give us a task, let's put a time. So he says, Shachar, look at me, any minute from now. <laughs> So last month in March, we took him to Israel for eight days where he met with so many people. And one of the things, a lot of people he brought to Israel and others. And you know what he said, Mark? 
thing. He looks up and he said, you did all of this in 70 years? Such a short time to create these miracles? Amazing perspective. That's lovely. All right, Shachar, I want one memory. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's from your childhood, as a young adult, but I want one memory that you have personally that you feel in some way represents who you are as an Israeli and what Israel is and what you wish to share with the JBS audience. One personal memory. One personal memory would be the building of Israel. The first place we uh, went to live as a family was Amidar, the national housing company, gave our family an apartment on the fourth floor on the outskirts of Ramat Gan. The entire place was filled with sand, sand, and more sand. And I'll never forget, you know, being there, one of the things I learned from my grandparents when they looked at me and they said, Shachar, you're so lucky, we're so fortunate to be here today. And the memory that sticks to my mind was um, the Friday nights when my grandfather used to come back from shul and walk with his best clothes on the sand and it was windy and he's holding on to his hat and I'm looking at him as a child from the fourth floor, the balcony and said, Grandpa, Saba, Saba, it's fine, I'll come and help you with the hat. And you think about the emergence of Israel because when you go to that part of, the, uh, of Ramat Gan today, it's filled with unbelievable skyscrapers, roads, schools, community establishments. It's incredible to see the progress that's been made. That's marvelous. And to me, that's the innocence of the country. How many times have you been to Israel? Uh, certainly. A number, right? <laughs> too many to okay. count. So I'm asking you the same question. One memory. You have 60 seconds. I want a quick memory. I don't know if I've ever told this story on your show before, but it, uh, it is uh, on, ongoingly haunting. I happen to be there. Shahar knows. Is it you know when you uh, you enter the IDF, you, you take an oath either on on Masada, right? But you can also take it at the wall, right? I don't know why there's a difference, but there is a difference. And I happen to be at the, the, in the old city at that time, and I wasn't exactly. This was an earlier period of time. I wasn't exactly sure what was happening. I knew it wasn't a military operation. So I happened to walk to someone who looked like he, he spoke English. He did actually speak English because he was African. I immediately assumed he was Ethiopian, but his English was superb. And I said to him, he was a major in the IDF, and I said, uh, where, where are you from? He said, my parents were from Chicago. And we're, he said, uh, were you Jews? And he said, no, my parents just moved to Israel. And I said, why? He said, well, they just thought it would be a good place to live. Mm. And I said, well, where is everyone now? He said, well, we ended up moving back to Chicago. So I said, well, whatever happened? He said, he said, I'll never forget this. He said, I felt it was important that I come back and protect this country. And he wasn't, Ju he wasn't Jewish. And I, and I said to him, I said, so uh -huh. the security of this country is important to you. And he gave me this look. He looked at me and he said, very important. That's a wonderful story. And I, I have never forgotten. It's a haunting image. Very important. Amazing. All right, one of the Amazing. things we're going to be doing here all night is bringing you the thoughts of major Jewish leaders who have either talked to us on phone, some of them will be in studio. And I want to begin by bringing you the thoughts of one of the leading voices on the American Jewish scene, but really on the world Jewish scene. He's the CEO of the American Jewish Committee, David Harris. Here's what David Harris has to say on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Think for just a moment, JBS viewers, May 8th, 1945. The end of the Second World War in Europe, a time of, obviously of celebration that the Allied nations had vanquished um, the Axis Nazi powers. But think where the Jewish people stood on May 8, 1945. Think of the numbers, think of the horrors, think of the losses, think of the empty spaces. And exactly three years and one week later, we went from the lowest point in Jewish history, arguably to its very highest, to its peak. The announcement on May the 14th, 1948, of the rebirth of the State of Israel. Three years, three years from Auschwitz and Birkenau and Buchenwald and Babi Yar and Treblinka to that announcement of the rebirth of the State of Israel, of Jewish sovereignty. Uh, and what does Jewish sovereignty mean in this circumstance, Mark? It's not just the act of, of any nation. It's the Jewish people saying, after thousands of years, 
we will become the masters of our own destiny. We will chart our own future. We will no longer be the minority subject to the good will of the majority when too often the will was not good. We will take responsibility for our Jewish future. That to me was the most, uh, most audacious, uplifting and inspiring moment in modern Jewish history. Marvelous. <laughs> On JBS, as we celebrate Israel's 70th birthday, what better person to welcome back to JBS than Israel's Consul General in New York, Danny Dayan. And by the way, Danny is here now with a special guest of his own, his daughter <laughs> Ophir. It is a pleasure to welcome you. And Danny, I can't thank you enough for, you know, in all so you're nice. doing, all you're That's doing so today, nice. and you're running from place to place to place, that you made a point of being here with us on this Definitely. live telecast is wonderful. You've heard what Thane and Shahar has to say, but I want to ask you a similar type question. I'm not asking you as, as Consul General of the State of Israel. I'm asking you as a person. You've had a long, wonderful... By the way, where were you born? Buenos Aires, Argentina. And when did you go to Israel? When I was 15. So you grew you up... You know, we were due to be the last to of 1970. Our flight was due to, this, to, to, to arrive to Ben-Gurion Airport. Actually, Lod Airport. It wasn't even yes. named Ben-Gurion. On December 31st, 1970, at around 11.30 p.m. But it was an Elal flight, so we were the first Olim of 1971 because it was delayed. <laughs> Do you remember that moment? Of course. What, was, what did it feel like for you? You're wow. 15 years old. Yeah, I was 15 years old. But I actually, I kissed the ground. I am not ashamed to say that. I kissed the ground of Eretz Israel. It was a dream come true. I knew as a child, I, I, I always knew that we eventually We'll make Aliyah, we'll move to Israel, to our ancient homeland. You we never always visited. Knew. Yes, I always knew. That the day will come and we will do it. And uh, yes, when I descended from the uh, uh, El Al flight, I actually kissed the That is ground. lovely. All right, so here you are. It's the 70th anniversary. You're not a 15-year-old kid anymore. What's it mean to you, Israel turning 70? It, it means everything. Look. I will tell you this. There are three ways of looking at this anniversary. The first is to take a st still picture, a still photograph of Israel in, in 2018 and analyze it. It's a wonderful country, an amazing country, imperfect as any other country. The second way is to take two still pictures, one of 2018, one of 1948, and compare between the, both of them. That is mind-boggling. It's completely incredible what we achieved in 70 years. And there is a third way, a film, not a still picture, a film that starts in the year 70 AC with the destruction of the ah. temple and goes through Jewish history of 2,000 years of Good exile, persecution, yes. massacre, oppression, discrimination. And then you understand what this means, that we are, as one of my friends wrote in the New York Times yesterday, the most lucky generation <laughs> of Jews. That is so wonderful. By the way, I am annoyed at myself that I didn't think of the connection of 70 CE when ultimately yeah. Rome destroys the Second Temple and we are at that point exiled and the Sethic, this is the 70th anniversary. That's and that right. contrast, by the way, gives me chills. How do you feel about that? Yeah, how come we didn't, we didn't pick up on this? Yeah, what's 70, wrong with us? 70, this is Masada. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the story of Masada. You, is, as the, as is, you hear Danny talk about it? It's the resurrection of the dry bones. It's the yeah. momentous uh, fulfillment of a biblical prophecy. It's taking a moment from reality and understanding the vision of celestial interventions. There isn't any other way to explain this, this coming back from literally the dead of a country coming back to life in such an incredible way. I will take you back to the rationalist that am I, that I am, and, and say that when you, see, when you look at Israel that way, where we were, and what way we did, what horrible way we, we went through, and then you see what we achieved today. Yeah. I mean, all the imperfection, to deal with the imperfections instead of dealing with the big, amazing yes. pictures so, seems so pit petty. Nonsense. Norishkeit. Ridiculous. Okay, Ophir. Yes. First of all, aren't you proud of your father? Of course. 
you are a. Not because I am proud of her. <laughs> I am sure well, you, you know, are, and there's a lot to be proud of. <laughs> you are, uh, you're at Columbia University. You're a political science major. True. You're also very much involved with SSI, correct? True. Student Struggle for Israel. Um, you're a different generation. It's important to hear from you. You heard what your father had to say. Pretend you didn't hear him. And just tell me, what's Israel's, how many times have you been to Israel? Well, every day for the past uh, next week, 24 years. <laughs> Except for the almost year that I'm here. That's all. You were born in Israel where? Uh, in Malish Amwan. It's a small community in the Samaria. Um, yeah. Okay. Born and lived there until I moved here. So what's it mean to you? 70th anniversary of the State of Israel. Look, I am from a generation that had the extreme privilege of living in Israel, being born in Israel. I had the extreme privilege of taking a year before the army to volunteer for an entire year for my country. I had the privilege to be an officer in the IDF. And I had the privilege to come here to the, to the United States and go to an Ivy League school knowing that I have always a place to come back to and my home is there and there are people protecting my, my country. Um, so it means the world for me to be able to sit here and protect my country from a different place uh, with students supporting Israel as Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, and still know that anywhere I go, my country, my homeland is Israel and always look forward to the next time I'm home. That is beautiful. Um, I, you know, I asked you, Shachar, the question as well, but I'm now asking you. Yeah. I want a memory. I don't care if it's as a child, as a teenager, as you think about Israel, what moment, or moments for that matter, strike you and, and you carry them with you always that you feel are about Israel? Every one of us grows up, we have a life. But I'm asking you, in terms mm -hmm. of the Jewish state, can you give me a memory? It's going to be a little cliche. Okay, um, The okay. day I, I finished my officer's training school, uh, we had our ceremony. And there's a tradition, it's like actually... When you're an officer in the IDF, uh, when the, you hear the tikva, you have to salute. Um, and we got our, our ranks after the tikva. Uh, and then we, it was before the ceremony, and we told the, the director of the ceremony, Where was listen. It? Uh, it was in my officer's school, and I told the director, we all told him, listen, there is no way we're getting our ranks after the tikva. We have to salute in the tikva. <laughs> and like, he told us, you know what, like, okay, so tomorrow you're going to have a, a ceremony, a different ceremony in your unit, and you can salute tomorrow in the tikva. But we didn't let it go for two weeks until this guy, the director of the ceremony, told us, you know what, I'll give you the, the ranks before the tikva so you can salute. And that is the mm -hmm. most Israeli thing to me, to be proud and to not give up for this one opportunity to salute five minutes later, five minutes before uh, you can actually do it. Uh, and in my officer's uh, school, I had Jews, Muslims, Christian people, Jewish people, and all of us together felt it's so important for us to salute in the tikva, and that's the most Israeli moment for me. Isn't that lovely? I was smiling at every word. That was just, <laughs> I, and I also was saying, I loved how she ended up by saying that, was, that itself is so Israeli, right? Yes. That sense of resourcefulness and sense of patriotism and purpose and commitment and devotion and... Uh, Danny, you have a lot to be proud of. Yes, yes definitely. Yes, definitely. <laughs> How beautiful it is to hear it. You know, sometimes we as adults, we have a tendency of looking down at the younger generation yes. and said, oh, we understand. <laughs> but our younger said they have no idea, no appreciation of a sense of history. And just sitting here and listening to Ophir, I am just blown away. Yes, it's very, very impressive. Um, you know that uh, an Israeli female minister uh, just say a few days ago without naming who she means uh, that Israel is ready already for a second uh, female prime minister. I think she <laughs> meant that. <laughs> well, let's hope Israel would be ready in like 20 years from now. Yes. But <laughs> if it ever is true, you must announce on JBS. No problem. No problem. Okay. Well, I can we're, do we're, it now. Ophir, we're going to show the film. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, Mark Golub will take advantage of this moment. I have no greater cause in the state of Israel. You can announce it now. That's I have no sweet. other plans. That's very sweet. Um, you mentioned a moment ago that in your unit, it is multicultural. Mm -hmm. um, very often Americans, and American, even American Jews, do not understand the extent of that cultural pluralism. I mean... I'm making a point of this, Denny. This is celebration. 
on JBS, we very often talk about the challenges confronting Israel. I'm not interested tonight. Tonight is all about celebration. You're right. Okay? And what I want to hear from you is how you would describe, for viewers who just don't understand, the extent to which you, as a young Jewish Israeli, are surrounded by a culture that is, in fact, diverse and embracing, and you know, how you would describe it to those who have never experienced it. Look, if there is something I've learned uh, over the past year or so, is that no matter what I say, there is nothing like being in Israel. People can, can't really understand to that, the, the extent of, of like the magnitude of, of that experience if they're not in Israel. Uh, but I'll try to describe it. I think what made my, my military service so unique is the fact that I, I had the extreme privilege to serve with Druze, with Bedouins. I served uh, two years as an officer in the 80th Division here a lot. My best friend was a Bedouin. I was uh, um, one of the commanders in my unit. Uh, and, I, and his de devotion to the state of Israel and his understanding that his faith and the faith of the Jewish people in the state of Israel are intertwined in a way that it's a really an, what we like to say about the U.S.-Israel relations, an unshakable bond. Uh, if he won't be there to fight for the state of Israel, nobody would. Uh, and it's his responsibility as much as it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'll add one thing, is you're right, there is nothing like being in Israel. But it's not always about the what, but very much about the how. Because if we stand up for that great ideal that's called Israel, it's embedded in who we are and how we carry ourselves in life, in how we interact with people, are we able to lend a hand, the problem-solving approach, the smile, all of that we are every day is a manifestation of Israel. Mm -hmm. A smart person once called it Hadal. Mm -hmm. It's a term uh, that Jabotinsky used to use uh, to describe how we should be noble uh, on the noble. East, noble. east out and out. I think that uh, Ophir is the, maybe the only person on earth that is a fifth generation disciple of Zev Jabotinsky. Really? <laughs> really? Is that by the way? Are you comfortable with Jabotinsky of also? Course. Yes. Of course. Unfortunately, people don't know enough about him in America. Actually, when I came to New York, I brought with me to my new office uh, in uh, New York only three posters, three pictures. One of uh, Benjamin Zev Herzl, one of David Ben Gurion, and one of Zev Jabotinsky. I think those were the three giants of Zionism. And I want to say a word about the word Zionism. I think we have, uh, we have an obligation to make an effort to reivindicate the word Zionism, to reclaim the Z word. Yeah. Uh, Zionism is the most incredible, the most exciting, and also the most just national liberation movement of the 20th century. And uh, you know, <laughs> I sometimes, uh, when I want to suffer, I make a search on Twitter or Facebook in the word Zionism, and I see what things are, how it is vilified, distorted, what things are being said about this amazing movement. Um, and I think we have a duty to reclaim that word, to reclaim the dignity, the honor of that word, which, uh, if we are celebrating today 70 years of Israel, is because of that great visionary that his name, Benjamin Zev, Theodor Herzl, and his successors in the Zionist movement. Uh, for me, Zionism is a, is a holy word, it's a sacred word. Mm -hmm. And I think we must do more to reclaim the place that this uh, word deserves in our hearts. Your reaction to that? I love that. Me uh, too. I, you know, I'm such an admirer of Danny Dunayan, and uh, <laughs> hearing that was so beautiful. Also, you know, the two things that I did not put to connect before. Uh, one, I think, I hope we didn't miss this, that Danny Dayan, if I'm not mistaken, your family was living in Buenos Aires when Eichmann was kidnapped by the That's Israel. correct. So yes. when he mentioned the El Al flight that brought him, I remembered <laughs> that the very first El Al flight to Buenos Aires was to bring Eichmann back. That's correct. So that's one. We one didn't thing. know that at the time. You would not have known, <laughs> but it's a great anecdote. That's correct. Uh, uh, the other idea is, uh, by know, the way, the second El Al flight. There is no, there are no direct flights between uh, 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 it, uh, Israel and Argentina. But the second was the flight that brought Prime Minister Netanyahu 
a few months ago ah. to the first historic visit of a sitting Israeli prime minister to Latin America. And uh, the other thought was when you, uh, we talked about Ophir and her father and Jabotinsky, because we realized the, the range of the Zionist uh, dream and ideology. You know, my father <coughs> was in Radom, Poland, and in gymnasium, in his high school class, he was a revisionist, Jabotinsky follower, right? And then his son is sitting with you mm -hmm. in New York and it, in New Jersey, and it makes me think of something that, that Shahar said a moment ago. I was very struck by, notice the language he used, something about a biblical prophecy, and he said something about it's a, there was another word. The bones. The, the bones and resurrection, and bones. you said a kind of a, a not an epiphany. Celestial. 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 Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, the year 70, that year of the destruction of the temple really is the beginning of why Jews are all over the world. That really started the idea that I mean, Jew, then there were Jews that were in Rome. And from that point, you know, they ended up in Fort Lee, right? I mean, we're everywhere. I mean, here right. we are, we're celebrating Yom Hatzma'ut. And we have Israelis. I'm sitting with Israelis. And I'm sitting with a reformer, reformed, present reformed rabbi who has a television network on, on Jewish life. And we're in the United States. And JBS is covered all over the United States. And really, that really did start with this prophecy that Shahar said. Because we wouldn't have been here. We would have not, I mean, not only are we celebrating Israel's 70th birthday in this new millennium, but we're celebrating it from this distance. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is, when you think about this prophecy, it makes it even more extraordinary exactly. that we're spread all over the world and we're on this television show in the United States with Israelis talking about this. I will tell you a very personal story. My father crossed for the first time in his life an international border inside the potato sack. The year was 1921, and the border was between the Ukraine, his native Ukraine, and Poland. And they escaped the pogroms. And they put him in a potato sack. He was six months old, muffled his mouth, and opened on the Polish side to see if he's alive. And then, uh, a few decades later, I crossed a border the international, the virtual border between the United States and Israel with a diplomatic passport in an aircraft with a Hebrew speaking crew with a Magen David in its tail. I have a diplomatic passport with the emblem of the state of Israel, the menorah, and the policemen that come to escort me and not to persecute me. And my daughter, my daughter has, knows nothing but the self-confidence that growing in a independent, sovereign Jewish state gives you. So those are three generations of my family, but that is the, also the incredible story of the Jewish people in the 20th or 21st century. Can, can I just have the record reflect that the camera was not on or fear at the time, but she was <laughs> weepy. It was and very sweet. I've heard was, the story so many I know, times but that to it watch, me emotional it, every to, single time. To watch your daughter's re facial reaction to hearing about her grandfather yeah. and father was really quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. Before I let you go, I want you to tell our audience, what does Dan feel is the most important thing you would love Americans to understand about Israel that you feel they don't understand well enough, especially now on the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel? I want, to, uh, I want American Jews and Israeli Jews to understand that we have a common faith. Look, I, I think that in this generation we have two extra mitzvot, extra obligations. One is to strengthen the state of Israel, to guarantee the existence of a strong state, and the second, the continuity of the Jewish people. And it will be a tragedy if we in Israel are exclusively responsible for the existence of Israel and American Jews exclusively responsible for continu the continuity of American Jewry. We need me, to use a cross here, but uh, a cross responsibility. The Israeli Jews have to be responsible for the state of Israel and for the world Jewry and vice versa. If we choose different paths, only Israelis will care for Israel, only American Jewry will care for American Jewry. That will be a tragedy, but I hope it will never happen. 
Tani, I can't thank you enough for stopping by. Ophir, thank you so much. I wish you both, both kol tuva hatzlacha and mazal tov on this very special day. Thank you so much. I can't guarantee you that uh, I will forever remember this interview. I think this is our first joint interview. <laughs> <laughs> that is together. Yeah. Wonderful. Love it. Uh, there you have it, the voices of Danny Dayan and his daughter, Ophir. Another extremely articulate voice who speaks and writes about the state of Israel all the time belongs to an Israeli who made Aliyah some 20 years ago from the United States, Daniel Gordas, Senior Vice President at Shalem College in Israel. He's a prominent Israeli author whose most recent book is entitled The Promise of Israel, why its seemingly greatest weakness actually is its greatest strength. And when I spoke with Daniel from, on the phone from Israel, he spoke about the character of the Jewish state that makes it such a very special country. Daniel Gordas. I think that um, this is an opportunity to really reflect on the ways in which Israel has changed dramatically from what it was in 1948. The day before the vote in 1947 at the UN, uh, the CIA went to Truman and actually begged him to pull back his support for the idea of partition, saying that at best, quote unquote, the Jews will be able to hold out for two years. Uh, the day before Israel, or the week before Israel declared uh, independence, David Ben-Gurion asked Yigal Yadin, who was one of the heads of the Haganah, what do you think our chances are of surviving the war that's going to invariably follow? And Yadin said 50-50. Um, those were difficult, dark years. We all know that in the early 1950s, Israel had food rationing. Israel had, as we thought then, no natural resources. So we had to convert human intellectual capital into a natural resource. There were, in 1948, about 650,000 Jews in Israel, which comprised about 5% of the Jewish world. Uh, today, Israel is the largest Jewish community in the world. It is about 45, 46, 48%, depending on who you ask, of the Jewish world. Um, we are completely secure militarily. We have an abundance of human capital. Uh, it's just an unbelievably successful story. It's very easy for all of us to look at all the things about Israel that we're not happy with. We wish there was peace. Uh, we wish there was less infighting among political parties. We are, of course, worried about the ultra-Orthodox. There's a lot of things to worry about. But this is an unbelievable success story relative to what we had any right to expect in 48. Jews taking the initiative to protect themselves is a complete existential reinvention of what it means to be a Jew from what the 1940s had been all about. The 1930s and the 1940s were a period of Jews watching with dread uh, as the circle grew ever tighter, ever tighter, as the noose grew tighter, so to speak, without the ability to do anything. Uh, it's 67 that completely changes the way that Jews think about themselves. Israel triples its size in six lightning days. For the first time, perhaps in hundreds of years, Jews take a deep, breath and say, now we finally feel secure, and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, even though I don't like to focus on the military dimensions of Israel all that much, I think that taking the initiative and actually saying, we're not going to wait to see what happens to us, but we are going to be the determiners of our own history and our own destiny, that's a critical change that Israel um, makes possible, not only for Jews in Israel, by the way, but for Jews all over the world. The people that make Israel chug along, and the people that defend Israel on a day-to-day -day basis, and the young people who make up the future of Israel are, I think, truly extraordinary young people. And as we turn 70, uh, if you ask me, am I hopeful or worried about Israel? Well, if you love something, of course you're worried about it. I have lots of worries about Israel. But am I fundamentally optimistic? I'm fundamentally brimming with optimism, because uh, the young people who make up this society are just an extraordinary generation of people. And I think a uh, 70th birthday is a very apt time to reflect on that. Lovely. The thoughts of Daniel Gordas. And he's optimistic about the future of Israel because of the young people of Israel. Ruth Weiss is a scholar, a literary social critic, and she's a unique figure in American Jewish letters. She's long been a professor of Yiddish literature and comparative literature at Harvard University as well as a distinguished senior fellow at the Tikva Fund. And Ruth Weiss joins us now on our JBS phones. Thank you so much, Ruth. And uh, I begin by asking you the question I've asked everybody. For you personally, what's special about Israel turning 70? <laughs> Uh, absolutely everything. I um, I echo the sentiments of so many of the people that of the people that I've heard speak on your program. 
Um, but there is really nothing like it in my life, and uh, I don't think that there is anything like it in uh, the history of the world, and certainly not even in Jewish history. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great moment of celebration. Um, 70 is supposed to be that year of really coming into wisdom, and um, I think that one can see at this point that Israel has really so much behind it. We always used to look to the future and say, you know, Israel is a country in the making, but I think that this is probably the first moment when one really can, uh, you know, have a sense of how far one has come. And um, it, it's just tremendously exciting. Yes, it is. Um, Ruth, I, um, I happen to be bat mitzvah, actually, on the day of Israel's birth. Really? Yes. Well, in those days, women did not have Correct. any bat mitzvahs. But I turned 12 <laughs> at exactly that time. That's wonderful. So, yes. Yeah, so I feel um, that really this is, it's always been kind of a personal um, uh, birthday. And, um, and I feel that I've reached the age of uh, maturity at this point. That is lovely. Ruth, take one moment, and I want you to tell our audience, what do you wish we all understood better about the State of Israel on this, the 70th anniversary of Yom Ha'atzma'ut? Well, uh, I think that people, I, you know, well, people who understand, understand. Hamavin uh, Yavin. I think that um, those people who really know how to appreciate the miracle of uh, what has been achieved know it. I heard from somebody in Israel, something I had not known, that the 10 days between Yom HaShoah and Yom HaAtzma'ut are now called Aseret Yemei Toda. The 10 days, you know that there are Aseret Yemei Tshuva, and these are called Aseret Yemei Toda the 10 days of gratitude. And um, I think that what people, I would wish that people would feel more is that this gratitude has to be the basis for our celebration. Um, you know, one has to pause and really just feel the extraordinary, um, you know, a- achievement of all the pioneers from the very beginning through all the stages of difficulty. And... Um, and I, you know, as far as Israel is concerned, I must say that I share the optimism of Daniel Gordas. Yes. I feel a little bit less optimistic, to be honest with you, <laughs> about American Jews. Uh-huh. And I wish that they could all feel the same sense of exaltation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that there's, there's a kind of holding back on the part of many people, worry, and they don't understand that it is not Israel's job to make American Jews look good. It's American Jews' job to make Israel um, not look good, but to make people appreciate it for the goodness that is already there. And Ruth, um, I think that that's our responsibility. Ruth, you say it so beautifully. I always am so appreciative when you share your insight with us. Kol tuv And to you, too, I say happy birthday. You celebrate with the State of Israel. And I'm so grateful for all the kindness you've shown me. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. All the best. All the best. (laughs) Yeah. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. (laughs) Ruth Weiss. I now have the pleasure of speaking with a man who has been a most prominent figure on the American Jewish scene, a voice that has spoken strongly about the State of Israel. He is the president of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rick Jacobs. Rick, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to be with you, Mark. Okay, Rick, I'm asking everybody, what's it mean to you that Israel is turning 70? This is a special Yom Ha'atzma'ud. What's it mean to you? Um, it's, it's both very personal and, uh, and filled with enormous joy and uh, such deep appreciation to, to think of all the milestones. They've all been significant. I remember... Uh, living in Israel for the 30th uh, anniversary, uh, and to think of each decade, the growth, the, uh, the, the vitality of the state, and frankly, the deep connections that I personally feel and that the reform movement feels. So I feel a great sense uh, of joy and, uh, and pride. That's lovely. Rick, you've been to Israel so many times. I want one special memory that you carry with you. 
Um, you know, I have, a, I have a host of them. I'll share this. I was a basketball coach uh, of an inner city basketball team in Jerusalem, uh, right near Machina Yehuda. And uh, I think we were the most spirited basketball team to play in the city league. We also had the shortest players. Um, and I just love this group of, uh, of young men, and they had such a, a, a good sense of team and they put their heart and soul. And, um, you know, we spent Shabbatot and Hagim in their homes with their families, mostly Eidot Mizrach. And I just remember the feeling, you know, going into these basketball games. And they said, Ruvain, that's what they call me, my Hebrew name. Um, it doesn't matter that we'll win. We'll play hard. Uh, we'll enjoy. And I think, to me, of the spirit of the state of Israel in that, in, in that experience and in those young men. That is lovely. Okay, Ruvain, take 30 seconds. What do you wish we all understood better about the state of Israel as we celebrate this Yom HaAtzma'ud? I wish we understood, the, frankly, the, the dynamism and the diversity of its uh, society. I think a lot of times what we read about and hear about, mostly in North America, is a very narrow slice of, uh, of, of what Israel is and, and the people all the different views, all the different ways to uh, express their, whether if they're Jewish citizens of Israel, the way they express their Judaism, their political views, where they're from, their stories from Eastern Europe, their stories from the Mediterranean. Uh, I just wish we appreciated, um, frankly, the beauty and the complexity and the diversity which actually makes Israel strong. Rick, it is always wonderful to share thoughts with you. Thank you so much for being part of our celebration. We will see you soon, and I'll continue to chase you. Thank you so much, All Rick. All right. My pleasure. Hug the well. And also joining us on our JBS phones is the Chief Executive Officer of the Conservative Movement's Rabbinical Assembly, the RA, Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld. Julie, thanks so much for joining us, and I ask you the same question I've asked others. What's this 70th Yom Ha'atzma'ud mean to you? Well, uh, thank you, first of all. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here, and it's wonderful to be celebrating Israel's 70th. And I think that, uh, you know, we say that there are 70 faces to the Torah, and I think in similar vein, you know, Israel has, you know, is now really coming fully into its own as, such a complex society that has so many aspects to it, right? Not only in terms of its, uh, its strength as a democracy, which it is uh, very strong and uh, really a, a model for many countries, even as it strives to deepen and strengthen its own democracy, um, a place from which almost every sector and sphere brings forth important ideas, not only in the kinds of technological innovation that we talk about, but, you know, I'm always most moved by the innovations in medicine, in uh, psychology, psychiatry, therapy, the kind of work that Israel does with trauma victims, the uh, methodologies that Israel has developed for delivering humanitarian relief around the world. Um, those are the things that I am most uh, excited about and proud about at this moment, that Israel is really kind of a light unto the nations for what it means to be kind to each other. Oh, that was beautiful. Okay, give me one personal memory. You've been in Israel many times. I want one memory that stays with you that sort of, when you think of it, it gives you a warm feeling, Julie. Uh, well, of course, as, as for all of us, there are so, so many. You know, I think... Uh, for me, it, uh, it was the um, ability to daven so many times with so many people at uh, Robinson's Arch, uh, what is sometimes called the Masorti Hotel, uh, which is the segment of the hotel where there is egalitarian prayer. And the fact that from that place uh, you can see the, the traditional hotel, the, the larger side of the hotel, um, and really have this sense that Israel is, you know, an emerging society, right? That, that in, in the sense of all innovation, it happens slowly, but it happens, 
right? It happens mm-hmm. gradually, but it moves. And to see that um, Jewish people all over the world are really striving, each of us and each of our communities, to find ways to reach out to God with a whole heart, uh, sometimes all together as one Jewish people, sometimes side by side, sometimes sort of each of us feeling like we're finding our ways, but, you know, coming together more than we realize. Mm-hmm. Julie, again, it is always wonderful to share your thoughts, and I wish you a Chag Sameach here on the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel. And again, I hope we sit in studio together very, very soon once again. But thank you for making time for me. My pleasure. Thank you so much for Be doing well. this. Talk to you soon. Take thank care. You. Bye-bye. There you have it. Ruth Wise, Rick Jacobs, and Julie Schoenfeld. Okay, well, what would a celebration of Israel be without music? On cue. <laughs> and what better person to have music with than Israel's ambassador of song, Ron Eli Ron. It is so wonderful to have you here. How are you? Terrific. Okay, you've been listening. Don't forget, my state is getting older. I'm too. <laughs> are you? Yes. Yeah. You I would not know, like not know it from looking at you, talking uh, to you, or yeah. being with you. All right. Before you play for us, I want to know. Yeah. So, where did you grow up? I grew up in which is a suburb of Haifa, by the Margelote from Emetaputu, Mount Carmel. Really? Yes. You're a Haifa I'm kid. Not, not, huh? You're a Haifa kid. I'm not Haifa. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you are, what are you, you are hyper. What are you talking about? <laughs> We're going to, by the way, we're going to mic you a little bit better. Hold on one second. What happened? Uh, mm-hmm. Who cares? Okay, so... Uh, What's it mean to you, Ron? You're a Sabra. What's it mean to you, Israel, turning 70? I didn't. I don't believe it. I say, you know, I'm one of those Israelis who's always there when everything happens. Uh, I, I find it, although I studied in New York, NYU, uh, whatever happens in Israel is, is a part of you if you're born in Israel. And that is, if you ask people here, the difference between living away or being born or, uh, somewhere else but Israel, it's not the same. It, there's a certain uh, immediacy. It's a part of you. It's like a voice inside. What can I tell you? You're talking about, you just say a word, halutzim, boom. I zoom back to when I was a child. I heard all those songs like, uh, what did they sing? Keep going, a little bit more, a little more. <laughs> Give me another Chalutzim song. Oh, yeah. Give me another one. Give me another I'm going back to the other song. It's very easy. Then you know if you remember from your childhood growing up growing up and joining a youth at Tunuat Noir, like the Boy Scouts, and, and there are songs around the Finjan. Everybody at home. Shachar. Keep playing. I, don't want, I, want, I want music underneath me. When you hear Ron do these songs, are any of these the songs you grew up with? I'm hearing my father. You're hearing your father? I'm hearing my father. He was just singing with him. 
That's I where I went to. I have a very nice son. He's a very <laughs> nice son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's true that the, the melodies not only transport us, but they also bring back periods of time. So that's your childhood in, in some way, right? And uh, it's the mythology of Israel. Yeah. Um, give me another one. I, I, I can go forward because... Go get forward a little according, bit. According to the songs and the subject, you know what year you are in, yes. really. Uh, like, for instance, Lo agadare ay, lo agadare ay, Velo chalom over. Hine mor har sinai, hine mor har sinai, Ase, ase, boer. Velo lo hev beshir, Sinai campaign. Excellent. Israel's ambassador of song. You're going to join us a little bit later in the show. That was fabulous. Uh, gentlemen, isn't it lovely? Uh, it, it, what would this be without Ron Ali Rana? It is that the a, 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 Aren't they fabulous? Well, they're, fa <laughs> they're fabulous, aren't they? <laughs> okay. The soundtrack uh, of Israel on our couch. Sure. Yes. Uh, this brings us to the end of part one of our four-hour celebration with you for Israel's 70th anniversary. I'm sitting with Thane Rosenbaum, Shachar Azani, and Ron Eliron. We're going to take a moment, pause, and as we do, we're going to share the message given to all of us from Jerusalem by the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and then we continue right here on JBS. Stay with us. This year, Israel celebrates its 70th anniversary. That's 70 years of freedom, 70 years of democracy, 70 years of bettering the world. Israel's success didn't happen overnight. Men and women from every walk of life, young and old, Jew, Christian, Muslim, religious and secular, men and women that have worked hard to build our nation. As I travel around the world meeting other leaders, I'm struck by their appreciation and admiration for Israel. They seek Israel's technology. They seek Israel's ingenuity. They seek Israel's genius. I'm proud that Israel is helping people in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and in many other places to live healthier and safer lives. Here's the best part. We're just getting started. 70 years is the blink of an eye in historical terms. And I have no doubt that 70 years from now, Israel will be even stronger, even more prosperous than it is today. Thank you to our many friends around the world. Happy birthday, Israel. <laughs>